So uh, just before uh, we, we start that, I'd like uh, the panel just to introduce themselves so you understand who else is sitting here uh, when you put your questions. John. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Goddard, Supervising Solicitor for the Residential Advisory Service, um, working for Community Law Canterbury. So RAS has been up and running for more than two years now. We've had more than 10,000 calls to our call centre from homeowners. We've opened just shy of 3,000 cases, closed about 1,800 cases, and still very active in the space. We provide free legal advice and assistance to Canterbury homeowners, and we have an MB-led technical panel with three firms of engineers and one firm of quantity surveyors who can provide free technical advice to um, our clients as well. Um, and I just a quick word um, tonight. A number of you may wish to speak to me afterwards. I need to get away at quarter past seven at the latest, so we'll just have to streamline those discussions tonight. I'll just hand over to Heather. Good evening, my name's Heather. I'm an earthquake support coordinator within the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. An earthquake support coordinator is available. It's a free service to assist you through your journey of repair and rebuild and negotiation with the various companies that you may be challenged to work with. We're there to support you, help you with providing information, attending meetings uh, with you to be another pair of ears, recording notes, etc. on your behalf. Another part of the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service is the matching um, accommodation, matching placement, and that's when you may have to move out of your home for the repair or rebuild and you may need temporary accommodation either in the private market or in one of the government supported uh, villages that uh, is available. And the third branch of our service is the financial assistance, which is the government assistance available when your insurance money may be, if it becomes exhausted, then you can access uh, the government assistance, which is not income or asset tested. And at this stage, the government has made that available until the end of December 2017. Thanks very much, uh, Heather and John. All right, so we'll move into question and answer time. So let's just remind you, just we I mean, just be respectful as we go through. I know it can be a, a bit of a frustrating time, certainly asking questions. Also, if you uh, have a question that you would like to ask but just don't feel comfortable asking it, you can ask Nathan to ask it if you've written it down. All right, um, or um, obviously see one of the panel afterwards and put your question there. All right, so thanks. Nathan, we'll just start at the back. Coming through. Ma'am, would you like to ask a question? Um, yes. Um, now, Renee, you um, mentioned about cash settling. Um, yes, now, I was cash settled by EQC. Um, now, um, yes, now, the insurance is still um, going on my house at the moment. Um, so you said um, that, it, um, that they might um, terminate it after a while if I haven't got a builder or you know someone to repair it. Yeah. So it depends on the extent of the damage. And if it was cash uh, settled no, by, no, it was only minor damage. Yeah. yeah. So you're probably fine as long as if it was cash settled by AQC, it was yeah. probably largely cosmetic, so it wouldn't really affect the yeah. ongoing insurance. I'm talking more about structural major repairs, and yeah. Um, yeah, we change the sum insured based on that. But I can talk to you afterwards if you like, and we can just double check that it's not going to be affected. Um, yes, but. Um, I've got to find out um, uh, about the um, foundations, you know, I've still got to get someone to have a look at those at the moment. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, talk afterwards and I'll see yeah. if I can help with that. All right. Ladies. Hello, I just want to ask about the cash settlement. You're talking, um, a lot of this might not be relating to me, but you're talking about uh, cash settle being a final settlement and working in your program. If we haven't even got to that stage yet, we don't have a choice, is that correct, to go into your program now? It is going to be cash settled no matter what. 
So our preference is to cash settle and the reason for that is our program is really at capacity but we are still repairing or rebuilding some houses. So it really depends on the individual situation and I can talk to you about it afterwards if you like. If there's reasons that you'd like to go into program then we look at those reasons and see if we've got a solution that works for you. But there's a number of different ways that we're settling claims. So there is cash settlement and that's, as I said before, a full and final cash settlement. The, for some people that is the best outcome because full and final means that actually then you're free to go and do what you like with the money and if you wanted to make any changes or anything like that then that's your decision to make. Um, there is also an open discharge and an open discharge would be used in a situation where if you had specific concerns about foundations, for example, then you might ask for an open-ended discharge for that portion of the repair or the rebuild. In that case, then if there were any contingencies allowed, the contingencies would come out. So in a full and final or um, settlement, there might be contingencies allowed. If you had an open discharge, then you wouldn't have contingencies allowed, so it's one or the other. Um, or there's also what we call builder-assisted settlements, and in the builder-assisted settlements, we basically get to the point of the repair or the rebuild, the builder will agree a fixed price, and then the only difference between us managing it and um, not is that we give you the money, so we organise the contract for you, we get the builder ready to go, and then we cash settle you the amount and you pay the milestones rather than us paying the milestones. Um, or there is a managed repair. There's a managed repair through the Hawkins program or there's other programs. So there are a whole lot of solutions and it really does come down to the house, the people, um, the best outcome for everyone. Just because like this hasn't been our choice to be this long down the track yeah. and still only just been told by EQC that we are now over cap. We could have been told because we have not had, you know, four and a half years ago. Mm. What has changed in that time? Mm. Yes, it's just been that you've been in the queue. Mm. But it's not all our fault that we were in that queue for that length of time. Maybe it was because we didn't make the squeaky wheel. But mm. I just don't want to think that we're going to be left mm. to manage this when we were a homeowner who didn't build, air. we purchased a home, all compliant, and we don't think that we um, are qualified to be a project manager yeah. so that's just my concern yeah that yeah completely cash understand settle, end of final well yep. we're only a homeowner not yeah. a builder or yeah the other thing is it depends on what your concerns are and like I say for everyone it will be different so some um, people are concerned about the project management element and in some of our settlements we've included a project management element so that allows you to get someone else to manage that for you. So what I would urge you is make sure you have a face-to-face -face conversation and if you have specific concerns then raise those concerns because one settlement approach is not going to work for everyone so it is about you and your home and the best outcome for you. Um, can I just jump in quickly, and this is a bit of a side issue, but currently there's a proposal to make changes to the Earthquake Commission Act. So for anyone who has concerns about EQC and the way that they've managed their assessment program, um, I would encourage people to make sub submissions about that act and what happens in the event of any future earthquakes or natural disasters. The number of people who uh, are in the last few months being moved from EQC into an insurer uh, field, so to speak, um, yeah, it's it's kind of it's it's awful for everybody because you get bumped from one place to another and you're kind of starting again. I mean, can people get I don't know a, a little bit of uh, better understanding because of that, because of this nature of the ways? And I think that's kind of a little bit behind what this. Um, this um, lady is saying. The other thing is, and the thing that I'm trying to urge our people internally to look at, is if people have been with EQC all this time, there's often really good information about your home on file with EQC. So before we launch into another assessment program that might take months, because to do a good thorough assessment of your home, it does take months unfortunately because by the time we get engineers, we get drainage people, we get asbestos people, we get roofing people, we get everyone out to 
do an assessment pack for us, that can take months. So the first thing that we should be doing is having a conversation with you about what you know and what information EQC or you have about your home. And then you start the process from there because it might be that you've already got a builder that you've been working with with EQC or you've got engineers reports and actually you you know what a, a good settlement looks like or a good outcome looks like and that's a place to start the conversation because one of the things for us is also around time frame so if we're going to start repairing or rebuilding we need to be doing that sooner rather than later so therefore if you've already got a whole lot of information about your home it's a good place to start because you're already part of the way there so in all of that, I think let's not think that all the time with EQC has been wasted and you have to start again because often we can pick up part of the way through the process because of the information they have. So if you've just come over CAP, then we have case managers on all of our claims. So a case manager should contact you to start the process. Um, but let me find out about your individual claim and I'll find out a time frame for you. But for anyone who goes into the process newly overcapped from EQC, and the reality is EQC are still giving us a number of claims every week overcap, and they expect to hand over the last overcap claim to insurers by the 4th of September this year. So in the next month there will be more overcap, um, but at least then there's a line in the sand that have said that they will have the last claim overcap then. Um, for our program at the moment, if we start from scratch assessing, it does take about three months. So we would contact you within a couple of weeks of having the claim, but then it does take three months to do all of the assessing and pricing and everything if we start from scratch. Ladies. Just, just. Yes, ma'am. Um, you, you talk about the things like the um, roof being done, the EQC have done a roof assessment, you know, plumbing, drainage. They've said they've put down in paperwork that they've done that for us and they actually haven't. Okay, uh, they're saying that we're under cap, and um, their engineer said all sorts of things about the floor, and uh, I had it GPR'd because what he said didn't gel, right? And it's full of voids, and the house actually z z seesaws backwards and forwards, and it was doing it while GHD Engineering was present, right? And um, there was a wall moving and the vinyl puckering up and it was all just ignored. Uh, and EQC complaints is who I'm dealing with now. And so far it's all just an almighty mess. They're, they're saying they won't talk to me. So I mean, how, how can you have a dispute when somebody don't, won't talk to you? So what answers has the insurance company got for that one? It is hard. I might not have a specific answer, but I can try and help. So what we can do is Brian can escalate from his end with EQC, but I can also check to see if we have any information about your property, because if we do, we might be able to help from our end in requesting a joint review with EQC. Oh, okay. Well, I can pick it up with Tower for you. So yeah, so you give me your details later and I'll speak to David Ash at Tower and I'll get him to see what he can do from his end. And I think, um, just speaking generally with EQC, the lesson that we've learned at RAS is that perseverance does pay off. So we've had cases which have sat there, sat there, sat there. And w one example is I had one case where we said to EQC, please review whether or not this claim is over cap. And they said it was, but the review took 18 months. So um, anyone dealing with EQC, I would just say, keep plugging away. Right. Not necessarily the easiest of news when you've been plugging away for a wee while, but uh, we do know that uh, you know, we just have to keep going. And uh, I think uh, the advice given here w w by Renee is that come and see us here at the Hub. There are things that we can do to assist. Don't say we can give you, you know, the magic wand, but we can assist. So, so please like, do come and see us. Thank you, Brian. Just a, a very quick comment in reference to what the last person was saying. Um, I'd had a, a relatively similar experience with EQC and found that my earthquake support coordinator, um, whom I engaged recently, has been utterly phenomenal. Now we're moving, IAG have been really helpful, um, and we've seen a completely different situation. So 
there are things that can happen, um, and Earthquake Support Coordination Service seems to be ringing some amazing magical bells to make it make it work. Well, that's a nice piece. Thank you. So over to the phone. Hello, Renny. Um, I with I'm with uh, IAG. Um, I've been with them about two and a half years. Um, we've really disappointed lately. Um, we had the scope of work done last year, and it went. Uh, we, we've rushed it through to get it uh, out for pricing before Christmas, so we could get it into the council. And then we were looking at uh, the repairs being started in May this year. And what's happened is uh, the the builder's gone, been taken away, so everything's been stopped. Um, we've um, the law suggested we add, all right? Uh, he's been taken off the case, our case, and uh, we've got no time frames at all for what's going to happen. Um, in, in the scope of work, there was a lot of variance work to be done when they were on site. Uh, none of this has been gone through for being priced, you know? So I'm just wondering how long are we going to wait now? Can you speak to me and give me your details? Because I'll look into it for you. Because it sounds like a lot of the work's already been done. So we either need to give you a builder and get the work going, or we need to give you a price that reflects everything, including the variations that yeah. have been noted. Yeah. Because we, we don't know now, because they sort of um, reflect whether it's going to be repair or rebuild. We've not even been able to be told that now, because of the amount of money they believe the variance work is going to come up with you know okay yeah so what we do is with any repair we cost the repair and we also cost a rebuild and then the outcome is based on the economics so maybe the hold up is we costed the repair that got very high hadn't costed a rebuild so now they're costing a rebuild but um let me get your details and i'll look into it tomorrow for you all right so thank you can i just ask a question that came this afternoon, which I'd like John to answer because Renee mentioned it earlier on, and it's about historic damage and when historic damage maybe interferes or comes into connection with the repair. And you had a, a, a kind of a three, a three point sort of way of uh, looking at it. So, could I ask you to talk about that? Sure. So, this question relates to the cause of damage, and in law, it's called causation, which is an extremely complex area of the law. <clears throat> but in the context of earthquake damage and historic damage, basically I suggest three scenarios. So the first scenario is where a different part of the house suffers historic damage, such as rot, and another part of the house suffers earthquake damage. So the insurer is liable to pay for the earthquake damage, but not for the historic damage. Scenario number two is where the same part of the house has rot, but is also damaged by the earthquakes. In that situation, the insurer has to repair the damage because they have to repair the earthquake damage and in doing so they also have to address the rot. And the third scenario is when a house is a rebuild and there'll be some parts of the house that have historic damage but even, so, even though that's the case, the whole house is rebuilt because it's a total loss. 